Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about government policy and human rights. Welcome back to Policy and Rights here on Depictions Media Radio. I'm your host, Michael Cloggs, and yes, we're going to beat this with it with this this uh, dead horse with with, with a stick. Um, we're going back to to abortion rights, and we're going at this from the point of view from the from the United Nations, and this was actually released uh, June 24th, and it brings up a good point because. Whether abortion is legal or not, it happens all too often. Data sh- shows that restricting access to abortion does not prevent people from seeking abortion. It simply makes it more deadlier. According to the agencies, um, and this is coming from the UNFPA and according to the agency's uh, 2020 Two state of the world population report nearly half of all pregnancies worldwide are unintended, and over 60% of these end in abortion. The UN uh, FPA said that it feared that the unsafe abortions will occur around the world if access becomes more restricted. Decisions reversing progress gain have a wider impact on rights and choices of women and adolescents everywhere. And the WHO echoed the message on their official uh, Twitter account, reminding people that removing barriers to abortion protects women's lives, health, and human rights. The whole decision process... um, uh, of this whole court supreme court decision isn't about rather abortion is right or wrong it is more about human rights and the protection of of those human rights um i am going to lead, lead to, to to stories that i was told by my mother who now my mother is old enough to to have known what life was like before um, abortion was legalized in the United States, or should I say, before the constitutional right was given by the, by the Supreme Court via Roe versus Wade. And there were stories of abortions going wrong and people trying to protect themselves by disposing of these young ladies' uh, bodies, by burning them, grinding them up, what have you, whatever they could do to, to hide the fact that the abortion went wrong, and then hiding the fact that something even ever happened to their daughter. Because of this, also the shame that was attached to to a pregnancy that happened out of wedlock. It's not a world that we need to go back to, and it is a world that um, that I think that everybody would choose to avoid. So we need to do whatever we can to protect human rights and while 
this is one particular right that has fallen for women. We also need to make sure, keep on the lookout that other rights don't start to fall um, as we move forward. That we continue the fight to protect human rights wherever we can. So, um, in this next um, segment, we're going to be hearing from uh, the the UN uh, uh, press conference, and they're going to be talking about um, the U is uh, events are happening in Syria, um, and the today the the humanitarian needs are unprecedented uh, the, that. There are a total of 14.6 billion men, women, and children that require aid, which is an increase of 1.2 million people from 2021. And it's the highest level of crisis be- since the crisis began in Syria, and the UN is desperately trying to bring it into conflict and put rest at, in place uh, for Syria and protect the refugees that are in need of aid. In Yemen, uh, the Office Coordinator of Humanitarian Affairs says hunger is now at the highest level of the country since 2025. And the country itself is in need of aid. And the World Food Program is forced to reduce the, um, the food rations to, for 8 million people due to funding gaps. And also, hey, we know that, um, that there's grain shortages globally because of the war between... Uh, Russia and the Ukraine. So there are lots of other problems, and then we're they're also going to be talking about uh, events happening in Sudan and Ethiopia. Um, the Secretary General is deeply concerned about the renewed clashes between Sudan and Ethiopia along the disputed border that took place on June twenty second, and reported results of death of seven Sudanese soldiers and one civilian as he urges them to take concrete steps to defuse and reduce tensions in that area. So let's listen to what um, the UN representative uh, to the press actually has to say in the actual comments and questions that that are asked in this next session. All right, good afternoon. Uh, Just want to let you know the Secretary General is uh, on a plane back here to New York. (laughs) Sorry Sorry to speak that sentence out so slowly. I know you were anticipating something else. But anyway, he'll be back. uh, He'll be in the office a bit later on today. Um, And the Deputy Secretary General remains in uh, Paris where she's participating virtually in Transforming Education Pre-Summit, which started there today. The reason she's participating uh, virtually is that she's just tested positive for COVID-19. Um, she's fine. Uh, she's well. Uh, and she said, in a, she said she's grateful to be one of the privileged to have been vaccinated. And she's thinking of all the millions of people who are still without protection. Uh, Ms. Mohammed called for a continued push for vaccines, leaving no one behind. Um, We issued a statement uh, yesterday in which the Secretary General uh, congratulated states parties to the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons on the successful conclusion of their first meeting. The Secretary General welcomed the adoption of political declaration and action plan, which helped set up the course for the treaty's implementation and our, that which is both important steps towards our shared goal of a world free of nuclear weapons. 
Uh, the lead, turning to Libya, the leaders of the two chambers of Libya's government are meeting today and tomorrow in Geneva at the invitation of Special Advisor Stephanie Williams to discuss and reach agreement on the measures governing the transitional period leading to elections. Stephanie Williams said at the start of today's meeting, it is, quote, now the, it is now the time to make a final and courageous effort to ensure that this historic compromise takes place for the sake of Libya, for the sake of the Libyan people, and the credibility of its institutions. As you will have seen, Rosemary De Carlo briefed the Security Council yesterday um, and said that the UN is firmly convinced that elections are the only path to settle disagreements over the democratic legitimacy of Libyan institutions, adding it is high time to agree on outstanding issues and make elections happen. She noted that Libya had made significant progress in the last few years towards a more inclusive society, and for the sake of the people of Libya, she said, we should not allow this progress to dissipate. Uh, this morning, uh, the Security Council is holding an open meeting, an uh, open debate on its working methods. This afternoon, the Council will meet again, uh, this time on the situation in Ukraine, which Rosemary DiCarlo, the head of uh, peace building and political affairs, will brief Council members on our uh, behalf. We'll share those remarks with you as soon as possible. Um, the turning to Syria, the UN resident and humanitarian coordinator there, Imran Riza, said today that humanitarians need an uh, said that humanitarian needs are unprecedented. Today, 14.6 million men, women, and children require aid, which is an increase of 1.2 million people from 2021 and the highest level since the crisis began. The rapid rise is driven by the deepening economic crisis ongoing displacement, continued fighting and in some parts of the country, and climate shocks. More than 90 percent of Syrians are currently estimated to live in poverty and food insecurity, which has reached historic levels. The UN is responding to meet needs. In 2021, over 7 million people were reached with life-saving aid uh, each month. This includes an average of 4.5 million people in need reached in government-controlled areas. We and our partners have reached another 2.4 million people in northwest Syria through massive cross-border operation, which we very much hope will continue. Meanwhile, we've reached, received just under one quarter of the $4.4 billion that is needed for operations to continue. And turning to Yemen, our humanitarian colleagues are telling us that hunger is now at the highest level since the con since, um, in the country since 2015. More than 19 million people are, on, are hung, going hungry, including more than 160,000 on the verge of famine. Funding cuts are hampering our ability to help resolve, uh, help people in need. Last December, the World Food Program was forced to reduce food rations for 8 million people due to funding gaps and had to introduce another round of cuts last month. 5 million people will now receive less than half of their daily requirements, and 8 million people will receive less than one-third of their daily requirement. More than eight, wi 8 million women and children in Yemen need nutrition help, including 500,000 severely malnourished children. By July, UNICEF may have to stop treatment for more than 50,000 malnourished children. 50,000. Also next month, UNICEF will suspend its work on safe, and, safe water and sanitation for up to 3.6 million. And by July, the agency may have to cut, will, will cut half its mine risk education activities, putting 2 million children and their families at greater risk of mine related injuries and deaths. Um, and on health care, the agency will suspend maternal child health support, which helps 2.5 million children and 100,000 people by July. Turning to Myanmar, our team there tells us that more than a million men, women, and children are now displaced across the country. In addition, more than 4 million um, children have not accessed education for two full academic years. This, dis this disruption to stable sc schooling is uh, placing children at much higher risk of, neg of negative of child labor, trafficking, and early marriage. We and our partners are staying and delivering despite serious access challenges and funding shortfalls. We've now reached 2.6 million people during the first quarter of 2022. 
our ability to reach the remainder of the 6.2 million people identified in the humanitarian response plan will be dependent on increased funding, improved access, removal of bottlenecks such as visa delays and banking restrictions. To date, only 11 percent of our $826 million humanitarian appeal has been received. And some good news for once from the World Food Program. Today they welcome the announcement by the G7 leaders uh, that they will provide an additional $4.5 billion to protect the world's most vulnerable people from hunger and malnutrition as the world faces a global hunger crisis of unprecedented proportions. WFP says it is encouraged by the G7 commitment to ensure that trade remains open for food, fuel, and fertilizer, all of which are critical for countries bearing the brunt of the crisis. And the Food and Agricultural Organization today released a report on how reducing trade costs, uh, costs help, excuse me, let's try it again. The Food and Agricultural Organization today released a report on how reducing trade costs can help drive sustainable development. The report aims to guide policymakers to find ways to ensure that trade policies safeguard global food security and nutrition, respects the environment, and bolsters against shocks such as conflicts, pandemics, and extreme weather. More information on the website of our friends in um, Rome. And uh, just uh, further, I think, to what uh, you, Abdelhamid, where's Abdelhamid? You had asked me yesterday on Ethiopia and Sudan. And I can tell you the Secretary General is deeply concerned about the renewed clashes between Sudan and Ethiopia along their disputed border that took place on June 22nd and reportedly resulted in the deaths of seven Sudanese soldiers and one civilian. He urges the two countries to take concrete steps to defuse tension and to peacefully resolve their differences over the Al Fashaga border area. The Secretary General expresses his condolences to the families of the victims. Voila. Kirsten, microphone, please. Uh, does the Secretary General have any uh, response to the horrific news of um, dozens of migrants being found uh, in a trailer at the, in Texas? Uh, I know he took part in the Summit of the Americas recently, and... Um, uh, any reaction, any way he can see to stop this problem? Well, I, I mean, let me just say on the specific uh, event, I think uh, he was shocked and, and, and saddened uh, to learn that I think the latest report talked about almost 50 uh, people, uh, migrants, died in the trailer uh, in San Antonio. Uh, it's very important for us that authorities both in the U.S. and in Mexico investigate and bring to justice all those who were responsible uh, for this horrific chain of events. Um, this horror, I think, once again highlights the tragedy uh, that migrants face uh, and asylum seekers. And it also highlights the need for comprehensive strategies for safe, orderly, and regular migration in the region. Um, it's very important for us that all parties uh, work cooperatively in line with the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration and the Global Compact on Refugees to take concrete action to help prevent such needless deaths uh, among people on the move. Uh, Edie. Uh, thank you, Steph. The um, G7 um, mentioned the Secretary General's package in mm -hmm. their uh, statement, and uh, the Italian Premier Mario Draghi uh, gave a briefing, and he called it one of the most important briefings that the G7 leaders got. And uh, I wondered, and he gave some details um, of what the Secretary General said. Uh, first, I wonder if there's any update on negotiations. And secondly, uh, is there any chance that we could get a similar briefing? Um, there is no update except to say uh, that the discussions are ongoing. And I'm... 
I say that every time you ask me, uh, but that has the advantage of being the truth uh, because discussions are ongoing. Uh, as soon as we have something to announce, something concrete to announce, uh, we will do so. Yes, Bitu. Uh, Stefan, on Yemen, uh, you talked about the rising need of humanitarian aid, but do you have any update on the soccer oil tanker? Uh, no, I think we're not nothing new to, to what we've already uh, what we've already said. Abdul Hamid, and then we'll go to Celia. Uh, thank you. Mohammed Zubair, a prominent journalist in India who criticized Modi's government for not apologizing for Muslims whom they insulted by the statement by one of his spokesmen. He was arrested yesterday uh, for his uh, tweets. Any comment on that? Well, I think, first of all, in any place around the world, it is very important that people be allowed to express themselves uh, freely, journalists be allowed to express themselves freely uh, and without the threat of any harassment. Your other question. My second question about a Palestinian child, his name is Ahmed Manasra. He was arrested at age 13. He served seven years in jail. His, his health is deteriorating. He was quoted as trying to kill himself. Another uh, court will be held tomorrow for, to consider his release. In fact, in fact, the first court re decided to release him, but the military decided to keep him. So any uh, follow-up to his case? Um, I don't have anything specific on the case except to say that we have repeatedly called uh, for the release of, uh, of minors. Uh, Celia? Hi, Steph. <clears throat> Each time there is a horrific event in the world, wherever. DSJ is deeply saddened. Could he say or do something better than being deeply saddened? Well, I mean, we asked for an initial reaction. You ask, people ask me for what, what his emotion was at the time, right? And we're talking about, uh, we were talking about the, um, the issue of the, the, the migrants in, uh, in Texas. Um, that's his reaction. You're asking me what he's doing. I think he has been uh, working for a long time to try to get member states to work together, to agree on a, on a, and, and to live up to the commitments um, made under the, the Global Compact for, for Migration. So, I mean, you can both feel shock and sadness and, and horror and also do something about it, which is exactly uh, what he's doing. And, you know, I, I, let me, since we're, you're asking me about that, I also want to say how, how uh, to use a term we've already used, but how, how shocked we were at the images of the violence that we saw uh, at the border between uh, Morocco and Spain uh, in North Africa over the weekend, which again resulted in the deaths of, uh, of dozens of human beings, of asylum seekers, uh, of, of migrants. Um, we saw the use of also of excessive force um, by the authorities. Uh, which needs to be uh, investigated uh, because it is unacceptable. Um, states have obligations under international, um, under international law and international human rights law and refugee law. Those, all those must be uh, upheld. Um, people who are on the move have human rights. And those need to be respected. Uh, and we're seeing them all too often disrespected. Um, and again, you're asking me what, what we can do, what we can do and what we will do is continue to push member states uh, to uphold uh, what so many of them agreed on uh, in terms of the global compact on, on migration. Uh, Philippe. 
Excuse me, when you say uh, follow up, when you say excessive use of force, uh, you mean uh, Morocco, you mean Spain? Uh, we, we've seen it on, uh, from what I saw at least, on both sides of the border. Uh, good afternoon, Steph. Uh, just a question on the East Africa, specifically the DR Congo. The East African leaders met to, um, and they agreed to send a regional military force to the DR Congo and to, I guess, help stabilize the resurgence and violence from the M23 rebels. So my question is, is on the, what you said in this press briefing last week when someone asked about this. You said the Secretary General supports this decision to send these troops to the DRC. So I have two questions. What role will the UN peacekeeping mission in DRC play regarding this? And why is the Secretary General supporting a military solution rather than a political diplomatic solution to this crisis? Well, I think the Secretary General is always supporting a diplomatic solution. Uh, the decisions made does not, uh, by the East African community, uh, is not one uh, that directly involves the peacekeeping force. Um, I think it is very important that whatever other military forces are in the region uh, coordinate uh, their activities and also focus their activities on uh, uh, focus their activities on the protection of civilians. I mean, that's what we want. I mean, there is obviously uh, when you have security needs because civilians are being killed right, by armed groups, there's, of course, a security dimension to the solution, but there also needs to be a diplomatic one, uh, especially when it comes to the countries um, in the region. Uh, we are also very much against the use of what we've seen are basically proxies of uh, countries using armed groups um, to drive home a point, to put it diplomatically. Um, so you can both understand the need for a security solution and also uh, focus on uh, on diplomatic solution. Yep. Recently, Jordan's uh, king, King Abdullah, uh, have told the uh, U.S. media that uh, the war uh, in Ukraine exposes uh, need of uh, a need for a Middle East uh, NATO. Uh, any comment regarding this announcement? My second question, do you, uh, does uh, really the, the world nowadays uh, in a vital need for more coalition military? Thank you. Well, I, I don't really have a specific comment uh, on that. Uh, you know, there have always been regional coalitions, security groupings, uh, and that's up for member states to decide. What we do not want to see is a decoupling of various regional groups uh, from each other. We think that th there is a, an increased need for multilateralism at the global level. Um, but we've also, also we, the UN has also always worked uh, with various regional groupings. But what we want to see is a regrouping and a reaffirmation of the need for global multilateralism. Uh, Edward, and then we'll go second round. First, I want to have a confirmation. Yesterday, uh, when mentioned about the Kremenchuk uh, missile strike, you said a, a shopping mall has been struck, which means the missile hit the shopping mall, right? Because that's not what the defense minister, uh, ministry of Russia said. I, that is our understanding. Okay. Uh, and, and I would say that uh, for us, any uh, uh, any attack, whether deliberate or undeliberate, of civilian infrastructure, where shopping mall clearly is, uh, goes against international law. So uh, my second question, uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky said that Russia must be labeled a state sponsor of terrorism because of these attacks. Uh, would would the UN consider Russia as state sponsor of terrorism? It's not for the Secretary General to designate uh, to issue these kinds of designations. Uh, Big tool. 
Uh, Steph, a question on Syria. The Security Council will be discussing the renewal of the uh, mandate which allows humanitarian aid into Syria. Uh, in the coming days, you also mentioned it earlier, but there are also concerns that the last border crossing might be closed. Uh, does the UN have a plan B, and what happens if the border closes? What are your concerns? What, what will happen if the border close, if the cross border uh, crossing is no longer available to the UN is that millions and millions of men, women, and children will suffer even more. I mean, I, I just read out a pretty horrific update of the humanitarian situation. Um, we need both. We need the cross border and we need the cross line. The cross line alone will not help make up the difference if we do, do not get the cross, uh, the cross border. Uh, has the UN accelerated humanitarian aid into the country in case the border closes? Uh, I think we, we are, if I'm not mistaken, at capacity in terms of bringing things, uh, bringing things in. Ephraim. Uh, just a quick follow-up on Yemen as well. Uh, do we have any, is there any progress on the issue of um, talks with the Houthis to open roads in Taz? Nothing to, no progress to report. Second one. Um, uh, in Libya, the meeting with uh, Ms. Stephanie Williams, um, before the meeting happened, were there any signs that these two leaders are coming with some willingness to compromise on the contentious, the most contentious issue of the constitutional draft? Because it sounds like it's still the same. I think what we're doing is looking forward to positive signals after the meeting. Um, I don't think there were much tea, re tea leaves read before the meeting. Yeah. Sorry. Um, that, it's okay. It's not very trivial, but I've been meaning to ask you, um, you expressed your frustration and the UN frustration at finding an SRSG for a place like Libya. Mm -hmm. And my question is, um, Stephanie Williams has, what is the difference between what Stephanie Williams is doing and what an SRSG can do or would do? Because apparently she's doing the same thing, apart from briefing the council, maybe, and apart from not needing the council she, to appoint she, I her. I mean, the, the, the big... But the, the difference the, between the, the two. There's a title difference. She's a special advisor, which the Secretary General basically has the authority uh, to name uh, by himself, which he did. A special representative uh, is named by the Secretary General with the, the, the agreement of the... Um, or consultation with the Security Council. Um, it is... Clearly, as head of mission, it is a more um, uh, a more formal and robust uh, post. But Stephanie Williams, as you say, has been doing the work uh, that she's been doing because while we wait uh, for us to be able to find someone that is acceptable to all Security Council uh, members and to all the various parties that wish to opine on the naming of such a person, um, Work needs to be done. All right? The situation in Libya is not put on ice, as we've seen. So, uh, as always, we are um, making do with the situation that we are, um, with the cards that we have been dealt. Kirsten and then Abdelhamid. Following up on the Safar oil tanker, are we not approaching the deadline on that? Well, the, uh, wasn't there a concern that once we got into the summer months, it would be impossible to fix? And so is it the financing that we're still waiting we're on We're still that? waiting for uh, for full amount, uh, for more money. Uh, I will check on the deadline issue, yeah, because neither you or me are clear on that. <laughs> yes, Abdelhamid. Uh, follow up on Libya. In his uh, remarks to the Security Council yesterday, Ambassador Tahir Sunni of Libya sent two maybe indirect messages criticizing the members of the Security Council for not agreeing on the special envoy. And second, that the Libyan, Libyans should be consulted on that. Do you subscribe to these kind of hidden messages in his statement? Far be it for me to comment or analyze a statement of a, a representative of a, of, of a member state. Uh, what I can tell you is that I think it's very clear from our side that we wish we'd had 
a SRSG a long time ago. Uh, but as I told Ephraim, in the meantime, Stephanie Williams is doing everything she can, everything she should be uh, doing. But this is a mission established by the Security Council. It needs, there's a mandate for an SRSG. Um, we don't have one. It's not from lack of trying on our part. Bitchul. Just a quick follow-up on Libya, Stefan. Uh, does that mean that the SG is frustrated with the Security Council for not agreeing on a name? And then does he think that not... Uh, being able to name a special envoy for Libya is also making it harder for the parties to reach an agreement on the elections. Uh, I'll just, uh, I don't think I'll express any emotion, but just to say that we've been at this for a long time, uh, and we will continue to go at it. I think in the meantime, uh, Stephanie Williams is again is you know I mean she she had a meeting in Cairo she's now got the parties to meet in in in, in Geneva um, what could have been if there had been an SRSG as opposed to a special advisor I, I think none of us can uh, predict but what I do know is that we've not been sitting on our hands in the meantime follow up would you say that it would make a difference if there was an SRSG no I, again I, I can't you know listen we I, I can only deal with facts and what we have um, would we have would we be in a different place today if we did had an SRSG three four five months ago I don't know I can't I can't predict uh, I can't predict the past uh, but we are where we are um, uh, Iftikhar, I think you had a question. Uh, thank you, Steph. My question has been asked by my friend Abdul Hamid. But uh, are you calling for the also the release of the Indian journalist who was arrested yesterday, as has been done by the committee uh, to protect I, journalists? Journalists should not be jailed for what they write, what they tweet, and what they say. And that goes for anywhere in the world. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.